Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so hi, hello. My name is uh, Andre, and I want to talk to you about how to make off the shelf distributions better work on, on single board computers. Um, who am I? First name is Andre, this is French. The last name is Pshivara, this is Polish. I'm actually German and live in the UK, um, but I'm proud to be here today in Brussels. Um, so um, this is kind of uh, two talks squashed into one. So apologies in advance, it will be a tough ride in parts. Um, if you don't get everything, uh, treat it like Star Trek, like you don't understand what realigning the warp coils really means, but you will enjoy the show anyway, right? <laughs> um, so the first part is about booting. Um, basically, what is the situation today? What are the problems and how to solve them? And the second part is about how to um, improve uh, Linux kernel support and make it uh, easier. And yeah, also what is, what is in there, why it takes so long, what can we do about it? Um, and therefore, feel dauntless to give a demo, maybe. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm with ARM, uh, limited in Cambridge, and during daytimes work on serious kernel stuff. Um, but this is not an ARM limited story, so this is all the stuff I do when the sun has set, right? Um, <clears throat> so this is about SPC single board computers, think uh, Raspberry Pi, um, but not particularly the Raspberry Pi, more the other stuff like Orange Pi and. Someone said fruit pie is a funny name. Um, yeah, so everything that has this form factor, maybe a bit bigger, um, has an ARM core. It's not about servers. Um, the SOCs we usually see are from, from Allwinner, Rockchip, MLogic, Mother, Realtek. Those small, uh, cheap SOCs which enable basically those uh, cheap development boards. Um, also, this is about DT in particular, DT device tree, which is a hardware description. Um, aiming at generic OS support. It's not about ACPI. Um, yeah. Also, when I talk about firmware here, I mean board-specific, low-level software, possibly including the bootloader, but not more. So firmware, sometimes if you s look at um, routing phones or something where firmware is um, the whole thing, including the kernel and including user land, this is not. So firmware is just maybe the bootloader, but not the kernel and specifically not user land. And this is about mainline, not BSP. Don't get me started on that. It's just not in here. Um, so that's the current situation. Um, <clears throat> that's kind of a table I tried to make up, how to find out what, what distribution supports certain boards. And I found it a pretty tedious to find, actually fill this table. And then, um, so the actual table is probably wrong, because the thing you find is out, outdated and stuff. And then everybody says, yeah, but we are supported anyway. But the sheer existence of this table is a shame, actually. So the, the point is that we have, you see, basically, what this table wants to show, you have some distributions, specialized, like Ambien, um, which actually support qu quite a lot of boards, in this case. Um, some distributions don't, and that's not, that's not bad. Um, I will show later, they actually do the right thing. Um, and there are some boards which are more, po more popular than others and are uh, better supported. Um, we're missing the kernel versions. Huh? So one thing, yeah, one thing, um, this is that thing. Uh, so the point is that this table is only a short excerpt, actually. So it should be uh, not, not five columns, but 300, which is the um, number of distribution that DistroWatch gave me. And it should not, like four boards, like I think 50 to 100. That's what we aim about, those um, SPCs these days, if you look at U-boot support. So the problem is um, this table should not be about distribution supporting boards. The actual technical dependency is that the kernel the distribution uses supports the SOC for that board. And once you have that settled, you don't need special distribution support for a separate board. Why is that? So what, is, what are the problems? Um, three things. Traditionally, there are no well-recognized standard ways of putting the ARM board, especially on 32-bit. Um, yeah. <clears throat> First thing, second thing, many boards come without onboard storage, which is really annoying. Um, so there's, by, by definition, there's no firmware on the board. It can't be. Um, and the third thing is that uh, with the current model, how we support those things, the distribution has to ship the board DT. So the distribution has to explicitly kind of um, support this board somehow. Um, yeah. So what can we do about it? The first thing about booting. Um, 
I know that many people see the logo, wow, UFI, that's crap and blah. Um, yes, we could do some U-boot magic probably to make this uh, work better. But if you remember the XKCD strip where we have 14 standards and let's invent something that uh, covers everything and then now we have 50. So we just use EFI. Um, it's there. Um, you don't need your asbestos trousers for EDK2 anymore. You can use U-boot these days because it implements it. Um, it implements it well enough. UFI is widely recognized and supported. That does not mean it's pretty, but here it is. Um, it's there. Most distributions support it anyway, especially on ARM64, because it's the way the servers work. Um, so you get it basically for free. Once you have UFI in the firmware, you can boot a distribution like this. No, no questions asked. Um, mostly distributions use Grub EFI and then load the kernel via this which is also good news because Grub is uh, well supported in every distribution for the x86 side, so all the stuff where you boot menu and kind of uh, init IDs and um, command line options, that's already covered, just finished. And the good news is it actually works already with uh, U-boot. Um, and you can boot default ARM64 EFI installer images. Okay, there's that card. Uh, second part is about uh, spy flash. Um, many socks that I, that I listed actually can support um, boot from SpyFlash. Um, they are cheap and they're not too big from a footprint. Um, the idea is that if you have SpyFlash on the board, you can put the firmware on it. And that's, uh, that's something that changes the game totally um, because it allows to, to keep the firmware f a separated from the mass storage where um, some and the partitioning tool may accidentally mess up the thing because it installs a GPT partition table and overrides your firmware, which sits in the front or something. Um, it gives you easily network boot support without anything, um, just because. You can boot U-boot and U-boot supports PXE and everything uh, works. And it, um, that's, a, that's a cool feature. It actually allows to ship the device tree with a board. Just you put it on there. And then it's like it should be. Um, also good news, um, U-boot supports mostly. For most SOCs, supports booting from there, loading from there. Um, and even for all Win, it's the same image, so that the same image can boot from MMC and SD, um, and yeah, from, from SpyFlash as well. Yeah, so it's a small step for board vendor, giant leap for the users, right? Um, so now the DT story. Who actually uh, brings the DT? That's some kind of question. These days, it's um, the, the standard way of doing things is um, it comes from the particular kernel repository you are building. So a building, I don't know, 414 stable kernel, and all the DTs that are in this repository then uh, are shipped with a kernel. And the good thing is that by doing so, those DTs, you're sure that matches the kernel and that works, and that they get reviewed and everything. Um, but the problem is um, A, that prevents supports for new boards. So everything, basically, to, to get a board supported, you have to have the DT in mainline. Um, sometimes that just don't happen because there's nobody taking care about it because they just do whatever they want. Um, sometimes that happens, but it's too late. So for instance, I mean, the um, kernel is shipped by the distribution, right? So if you just happen to miss um, that window where, um, where to get it upstream, then your distribution will not ship the board. Although it could be perfectly supported because it's just, it just a, a DT snippet that's needed and the SOC is actually supported. Also, that requires every OS to copy those files. Um, I always feel a bit pity for all those BSD people that do a good, really good job, but they always eat the breadcrumbs that get left over by Linux, right? So they have to take the DTs and kind of match it. And um, yeah, and in this case, they kind of copy the DTs from Linux or um, so it's, it's a really nasty situation. Um, actually, the, the T describes the hardware, so it should come with the hardware, right? That's kind of a logical thing. And that's how it was actually conceived in the, in the 90s with PowerPC and everything. Um, so what does that mean? Um, the idea is that the DTB now sits in the actual firmware image. Um, that how this is actually implemented is a, is a detail, I think. Um, it can be easily part of U-Boot. U-Boot itself has its own DT that's usually appended to the end of the image. And U-Boot is um, 
quite relaxed about what DT is, so it can easily change the implementation of Ubud to make it work with the normal DT that, that Linux uses as well, and we do this already for most, uh, for many platforms. Or it could be provided as a separate file in some container, so you have, if you have a fit image which gets loaded by SPL, you can put it there, and that's... Um, uh, the point is that this DT sits in the firmware and boots up. Um, the good news is that it, you get immediate support for new boards. So what, once you take, you get a new board that comes out. So for instance, there's, uh, this week came out the uh, Rock Pro 64 from Pan6, which is in uh, Rock Chip 3399, which is already supported. The SOC is already supported mainline. But of course, the board is not in 414 and not in 415, the, the thing. But if you could just create ADT, put it on there, it could boot 414 kernels, basically, right? Um, also, it scales much better because now we don't, we just have to, someone has to do it once for this board, and that's done. And that covers every distribution, it covers uh, BSD, it covers um, everything. Yeah, you get immediate support for, for other kernels. Um, the kind of disadvantages is, is that it requires um, stable DT bindings. So you can't just change the way Linux in interprets um, DDT, or you can change it, but you have to be sure to make it forwards and backwards compatible so that older DTs work with newer kernels and the other way around. And that is something, I, I believe it's possible. Some people say, nah, don't even try this, but uh, I think it's worth it. Um, and something that needs to be, uh, have a look at is if uh, kind of board vendors start to ship the DTs, they need to be reviewed somehow. So I mean, they can, they can take the route to the kernel, I believe, in the kernel repository, or some extra repository, or reviewed by the kernel community at least. And, um, but they should not be shipped by the kernel, instead shipped by the board vendors. OK, so here's uh, the, the things I propose. So uh, the first thing I ask for distributions to do less, basically stop shipping board-specific images. I know that you want to be certify your customers and make it as easy as possible, and and you bake a um, kind of an image which contains everything, contains the bootloader, contains the kernel, and contains the uh, your your actual distribution. Um, but um, let's better combine the efforts into creating generic firmware images. And by firmware, remember I meant possibly only the bootloader. So in this case, would be like U-boot um, something. Um, and then we can all work together, and it's not like Suze and Fedora and Debian also, they all do their own stuff in a moment. Um, so this can be combined. And those images should be distribution and operating system agnostic. So think about it should boot FreeBSD as well. Um, those firmware images contain the device tree. So actually, um, there are many boards. It's possible to actually ship multiple device trees with it. So you could have generic firmware image which supports a wide range of boards, and then you have some way to select which board you actually have. Um, those firmware images implement EFI boot services. That could be EDK2 if you like, but could just use U-boot, because U-boot is already um, supported by those boards. Um, and there needs to be some kind of update, mech mm -hmm. update mechanism, ideally, especially for the DTs, because the DTs they change. I said they change in the kernel because new stuff gets supported, and you want to you want to benefit from this. So it should be relatively straightforward to update the DT. Um, and board vendors, if they haven't done so already, they should add spy flash to their boards, possibly even preload it. Um, so some some board vendors do this already, and that's great. Um, the others should do this as well because it makes a whole difference. Um, yeah, I think I will cover this with a, with a demo at the end. Um, so the second part, um, just some things, some ideas about how to improve um, the, the mainlining of, of SOCs, of new SOCs. In a moment, the, the process is like, um, if you if it's a new SOC, then there's probably some, some first board using it, and that gets shipped to some developer, ideally, if the people are smart enough, some kernel developer. Um, and then the developer starts looking at what's needed to support this new SOC, and chances are that new SOC is not that different from the last generation SOC. So you can probably go ahead and um, copy and paste drivers that most affects clock drivers, pin control drivers, because they are the core of it and um, things. So then they add also initial DTSIs, so the, the core D 
DT and the board DTS for this first board to the kernel. And then it's the usual testing and discussion phase. Um, and then, um, yeah, eventually, if everything goes well, it gets merged into the platform tree first. That's about RC4, RC5 usually, depending on the, the platform. And then if that goes well, it gets merged into Linux tree, so the next RC1. Then it takes the whole testing cycle, and it gets released into a vanilla kernel. And then this uh, kernel hopefully gets picked up by a distribution, which uh, may take a while. So if you have bad luck and you just missed the window and your distribution releases every half a year, then you have to wait like five and a half months or something. Um, yeah. So it takes a decent amount of time. I think kind of edit it up and ideally, if everything goes well, it's 20 weeks to reach mainline plus the, the thing. So, uh, yeah, why is that a problem? Um, so what, what can we do about it? One thing would be we make those boards as C documentation available earlier. So that's how proper um, computers work, right? So if you look at Intel, they really start upstream very early at a point where no one publicly has access to the board. Um, so they have time for about a year or even more to do the proper upstreaming, and that's, that's great. Uh, to be honest, I'm not too hopeful that this will happen um, for many um, of those um, small SOC vendors. Um, yeah, so that's something that should be aimed for, and I think that worked quite well last year for Rockchip. They started to upstream the 3399 really early, um, and from a guy within the company, which is basically what we need to do. And that worked out pretty well, so by the time the first board was released, the SOC support was mainline. That's, that's pretty cool. But in case we can't do this, we can look at other options. One thing is that um, IP blocks are similar in SOCs, and by having more flexible device rebindings, we could exploit this. And also we can try to abstract something in via firmware interfaces. Um, so let's look at this first, the uh, um, more flexible device rebindings. Um, in a moment, there's this kind of habit that you have a compatible string which tells you which device it is. And the driver hard codes many things by looking at the compatible string. So there's some kind of matching, and then you say, oh, this is, um, that means that this has this many pins, and the pins are mapped this way, um, which is comparably easy to maintain, and you can make sure that it always fits and, and has some advantages. Um, but it, I think it would be better if you try to design more forward-looking bindings or try to work out what is actually really SOC-specific and what is more like an implementation detail, as I would say. So, for instance, we had this um, thing that we fixed the last time. The DMA controller works out that the DMA controller from the Allwinner H3 is actually the same as the A64 and also the R40. The only difference is the actual numbers, but they are, um, so how, which lines connect to which devices, but it is covered by a device tree anyway. Um, and also the DMA channels are different. So what we had in the, in the table so far is, oh, if this is an H3, then it means 12 channels. That was kind of written in a driver. So it turns out there's an actual generic um, property for um, DMA controller bindings, which is called DMA channels. So by basically saying, I put the, D, um, the number of DMA channels in the device tree, I kind of um, am able to support this one driver. So basically the H3 driver can support this. Um, and we don't need to support the A64 specifically in the driver. We just say it's compatible to the H3, but it has number of channels, which is eight in this case for the A64. And that, for instance, allows the, the R40 that falls into place because it has 16 channels, but it's the same. Um, so I sent a proposal for pin controller, which was a bit more involved. Um, that wasn't received too well. Um, yeah, I hope that this will be solved sometime. So I have an idea to kind of bootstrap this via U-boot and see if U-boot can use the new binding and then Linux can piggyback on that. Um, the second thing is um, using abstract um, firmware interfaces. So for some less performant drivers, uh, devices, we might be able to just drive some wire firmware. Um, so firmware means we do some, have some runtime component, which is not really running all the time, but you just call into, like PSCI, for instance. Um, and the cool thing is that this, there's, if there's some interface that requires only one generic kernel driver, 
and you can hide all the SOC details and firmware. And remember, you ship the firmware now with the device. So you can basically hack it up in a week um, and ship it. You can, of course, improve and update it and fix bugs, but it would be much quicker. Um, and for instance, there's ARM's SCPI interface and SCMI. ARM is really great in, in making up abbreviations and, and mixing the letters. So if you look at SCPI, it's the same letters as PSCI REST. It's amazing. Um, so anyway, that is, um, um, this is a firmware interface which gives you um, supports, generic support for clocks, gives you supports for, um, for regulators, for um, device power planes, which are something like um, you can easily just say, please turn this device on and off. You don't care about um, the regulator, particular which voltage it has, just say on and off. Um, also, it's DVFS, so CPU frag support, all this kind of stuff where you have, you don't need a table which tells you which certain uh, voltage and frequency match together. They're just exported by the firmware and you just pick one. And, and the cool thing is that SCPI is up mainline for a few releases already. So by just providing um, something, so I did a proof of concept as, um, implementation, just hacked it up in, in ATF, in an ARM trusted firmware, and that just worked and it gave me um, CPU frag support out of the box. You can have sensors to support temperature, voltage, current, so you can easily read out even how, how, uh, how much um, the battery is left or something that's also covered by that. And yeah, and new devices just fall into place. You just implement the firmware part <laughs> It's probably not much different, and it's much easier than in, in a super generic and abstracted Linux way of doing things, because it can be very specific to this SOC. Yeah, and then new support for that just shows up. And that's especially, especially tempting for the clock support, which is in the moment very so specific. And we had this problem with the H3 and the H5, which are pin compatible, and very, very similar internally, except for 32 and 64-bit cores, but that's not so much an, an issue in Linux. But actually, there was one clock more, because you need support. The, the MSC controller got upgraded to support high-speed modes, you know, so you needed a special clock, and one pin was more. So basically, we needed new drivers, which then were then copy and pasted or kind of abstracted, but um, it was just a shame, right? For this single thing, a single pin and a single clock, you need new driver support and D. Uh, older kernels couldn't support it, although they got almost there. Yeah, so what um, what could you do? Um, you could do testing, spread the word, and engage on mailing list discussions. So sometimes when I propose something, um, there are a lot of people opposing me. Um, it would be helpful if people say, yeah, it's a good thing, and it's something like we should do, and we should not be too fearful and say, oh, well, I guess that will not work anyway. So I guess in the end, even if we try this and that fails, we are not worse off than we are today. So, but there's the chance that we are um, better off. Um, yeah, so if you could help out to um, make SBCs behave more like real computers, that would be great. Thank you. Um, let me try the demo because uh, things, do we have time, I hope? So this is the... Um, Pine 64 LTS, that's an, a new version of the, the Pine 64. Uh, the changes is it has spy flash, which is why I demo this, and it has an EMMC slot, which is not populated, as you can see. And uh, it's feel like a magician. It can confirm there's no SD card in here. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's ideally how the board arrives at you. You take it out of the box, um, and it has ideally something on a spy flash. It depends on a board vendor, of course, but uh, for Pine64, um, they are very, very happy to do this. Um, so actually, that should even work with HDMI, but that's a bit too, too much for the demo, I guess. Uh, so I do it the wider old developer's way of serial. Mm. All right, so so this is um, this some um, this you notice for now. This is my kind of hacking pre-boot firmware which I put on it. Yeah, 
That's easy. OK. Um, so this is uh, something that doesn't work yet, but I, I do this. So basically, it boots uh, U-boot directly from the, from the spy flash. And you can then do stuff. And the cool stuff that you can do, actually, you can download your distribution from the internet, generic ARM64 EFI installer ISO, DD it on your USB stick, and you put the stick on here. Um, and then you say, ah, let's, you have to reset the USB because you doesn't detect it. It's, uh, that just reset the board. So this, this typing you don't have to do. So normally you just put it up, you get this, and you let it time out. And then it starts looking, it's all the magic u scripts, it starts looking for boot here, and you see a boot AA64 EFI. So and it picks up the EFI grub. But this is an old Ubuntu stuff which I just happened to lie around. And you just say install. And then the grub loads basically the installer. I get some error messages. And and voila, you get the, the installer, and then you can go on installing. Yeah, so that works already. Thanks. And actually, you can, you can download the image for the Pine64 from my GitHub repository, and I will populate the, the small images. But it's actually basically um, upstream uh, mainline U-boot. There's, there's no magic involved in it. All right, uh, questions? Okay, cool. <laughs> okay, uh, I fully agree with you that it would be nice to have the populated API flash on all the boards. Yeah. That would be the way to go if we can manage to get board manufacturers to actually do that. So we can, so for some, for some, some do. For some we can, some do it. Um, one of the problematic points is uh, actually having them provide a proper U-boot yeah. Proper mainline based U boot instead of a 10 years old Android port. So, the, the good thing is that um, the, spy support, uh, the spy flash support for the older U boots is not so good, so probably it will not work really <laughs> with, the, <laughs> with the old stuff. So, actually, the only working stuff is, is uh, mainline U boot. But yes, it would be, that would be something yeah. um, that would be required. But in the end, you can always kind of reflash, and those boards easily boot from S um, SD cards, and there are boards without spy flash, I see that. So chances you can provide generic images from SD cards, which act as the same, and then you can kind of go there. That's the second point. I would like uh -huh. to come to uh, the, the generic uh, firmware images, which I see as a kind of problem uh, as, well, we all know we have uh, problems, but the SPL is in some parts board dependent uh, regarding DRAM initialization. Yeah. Well, so what I have, um, yes, so, well, that, that's the ideal situation. You have one firmware image for one SOC. If it doesn't work, well, then you have multiple, but I try to keep it as small as possible. So what I did for A64 is, I have two in a moment because of what you said about DRAM. So one for LP, DDR, um, and one for DDR. And, but the rest is uh, kind of the same, and for instance, we can work out so what, what happens on the, on the old Windows stuff, you, um, the, the actual board name is stored in the SPL header. So you can kind of, while flashing this generic firmware image to your board, you actually tell it which board it is, which you know, well, once you have to know. I say it's a banana pie, generic images, and it looks out. And I have some, um, wrote some small tool which kind of helps you with that. Um, so you get a list of this firmware image supports multiple boards, namely those and those and those. And then you pick one from the list and say, OK, I have this board. Please flash this to the firmware. And then it can, the SPL even can pick. So what we do already um, in parts, in, in the ATF, we look at this name. And then it's a bit hackish. But 
we say, oh, that's a pine book. Uh, please enable the following power lines on the, on the uh, power management controller to enable the LCD, for instance. And you can do this before you actually have proper device free support and very early in the, in the board, so it's easy to do. You had a question? Are there, um, any easily added uh, spy flashes? Oh, yes, yeah, so, so for. On, let's so say for. On Raspberry Pi and all these other Pi's. That the same connectors, yeah? yeah, well, that depends very much on the um, on the way they boot. So on the Pine 64, for instance, all the pins are exposed on headers. <laughs> so that's how I started this. I put some, bought some sp spy flash for two pounds on eBay and put it on the um, on the on the headers with some cables, and then it worked as well. That depends very much on the board. I think many boards don't expose the proper pins. Um, yeah, but sometimes you can do this. So, um, so it, it's hopefully it's not vendor code. So the whole idea is about do this with mainline um, things. Of, so base U-boot and um, and the kernel basically is all the, the mainline DTs. And so what I said is kind of it's pretty easy if a sock is supported already to add board support. And that's yes, uh, review is nice to have, but if you do it properly, it's it's not much risk to actually screwed up. And if you screwed up, it won't work, and you will see, and you can fix it. And there's nobody accepts to be the first board, the chip, maybe to work fully out of the box, but um, the experience could be much better. And you avoid this like half a year latency, which is, which is annoying. And yeah. yeah, but uh, this is something that needs to be worked out, how we still make sure that the quality um, um, is right. And there probably needs to be some review, but it doesn't necessarily need to fall into the whole Linux um, way of, okay, we have RC1 and it's cut off and then we wait eight weeks and then um, better luck next time and stuff. So that is, yeah. okay, so yeah, find me outside. Okay, thanks. <laughs>